There is no vaccine for the Wuhan coronavirus pneumonia, but you don't need a vaccine to get immunity. These are the top five ways to become immune to the coronavirus pandemic. Hi, this is the Anderson Alternative Channel, and I'm Tom Anderson. Once again, we need to talk about the coronavirus pandemic. Now, this is my second video on coronavirus. If you didn't see my first one, go check that out, where I talked about the number one mistake that people make in preparing for the coronavirus pandemic. Today, I'm going to tell you about the top five things you can do to prevent from getting sick from coronavirus if the pandemic spreads here. Once again, I am not a licensed doctor, and this is not individual medical advice but I will link in the video description to all the research and all of the hard science so that you can verify it for yourself. So just a quick update on the status of the pandemic, which is now officially an international pandemic according to the World Health Organization. In an official statement released yesterday, following the second meeting of the emergency committee out of Geneva, Switzerland, the director general of the World Health Organization officially declared that the outbreak of 2019 novel coronavirus constitutes a public health emergency of international concern. As such, all countries should be prepared for containment, including active surveillance, early detection, isolation and case management, and contact tracing and prevention of onward spread. A new virus has emerged. We don't have a therapy. We don't have a vaccine. That disease has emerged and crossed the species barrier. It has spread and caused a major epidemic in China. Over the past few weeks, we have witnessed the emergence of a previously unknown pathogen which has escalated into an unprecedented outbreak and which has been met by an unprecedented response. I'm declaring a public health emergency of international concern over the global outbreak of novel coronavirus. The main this is the first international health emergency since the H1N1 pandemic flu of 2009. The reason for the World Health Organization's declaration isn't the rapidly deteriorating situation in China, which is really bad, but rather the fact that there are now confirmed cases in 18 other countries with at least seven cases with no travel history to China, thus indicating human-to-human -human transmission around the world. Following this announcement, the U.S. State Department issued a level four travel advisory stating in no uncertain terms, do not travel to China. Travelers should be prepared for travel restrictions to be put into effect with little or no advance notice. And then today, Friday, the Trump administration officially declared coronavirus to be a public health emergency in the United States. Health and Human Services Secretary Alex Azar said that President Donald Trump signed an order for the U.S. to deny entry to any foreign nationals who have traveled in China within the past two weeks. Following the World Health Organization's decision to declare the 2019 novel coronavirus a public health emergency of international concern, I have today declared that the coronavirus presents a public health emergency in the United States. But of course, the proverbial horse is already out of the barn. Travel restrictions now are too little too late. A group of doctors from the University Hospital of Ludwig Maximilian University of Munich, Germany, wrote a letter to the editor of the New England Journal of Medicine on Thursday describing a case of asymptomatic transmission. They wrote that a Chinese businesswoman from Shanghai visited Germany between January 19th and January 22nd and appeared perfectly healthy during her entire stay. Two days after she departed, a 33-year-old German business associate with whom she attended meetings became ill. Four days later, three additional German employees tested positive for coronavirus, and only one of them had contact with the woman from Shanghai. The others had contact with the German patient only. The Chinese businesswoman was later diagnosed with Wuhan coronavirus back in China on January 26th after she became ill as well. Thus, we have proof that asymptomatic persons are shedding coronavirus without even knowing that they're infected. We don't know the average asymptomatic but contagious incubation period, but it could be anything from 3 to 14 days. There was a documented case of a 10-year-old Chinese boy whose entire family got sick while he showed no signs of symptoms and had no fever, but tested positive for the virus in samples of his nose and throat, thus indicating he was contagious. Doctors suspect that his parents and grandparents became symptomatic within 3 to 6 days of the entire family being exposed. They didn't end up in the hospital for another 6 to 10 days after that and the boy was still asymptomatic at that time. Therefore, anyone who's returned to their home country or traveled abroad from China within the past month may have been infected. They didn't start screening travelers until a week or two ago, and only in limited airports, and only by checking to see if they had a fever via infrared scanners. 
but since travelers could have been infected and contagious without presenting a fever for up to two weeks, we have absolutely no idea how many contagious people may have entered the country. Until very recently, there was no genetic test to determine whether someone was carrying coronavirus. So I don't know whether we should be alarmed or relieved that public officials are finally taking this pandemic seriously. But they're probably already too late to stop what the simulations that Johns Hopkins showed could be a death toll of tens of millions of people. But either way, you and your loved ones do not have to be a victim of this pandemic. In my last video, I talked about why trying to prevent an infection during a pandemic is going to be a mostly useless activity. The virus particles in either airborne droplets or surface-bound fomites are going to be too ubiquitous in the environment for you to avoid infection, even despite your best efforts. The rate of cases in China is currently growing geometrically, even despite a total lockdown of society and everyone wearing masks. But if you look at the statistics, there are two important numbers. Those who have succumbed to the virus and those who have defeated the virus. What gives some people the ability to get infected but not die? And how can you be one of them? Or better yet, how can you defeat the virus without ever even suffering any symptoms? To understand that, we have to look at what happens to your body when you get exposed to a virus. Virus particles contain glycoproteins on their outer surface which attach to cell membranes in order to puncture and inject their genetic material into the cell. Viruses can't replicate on their own, but must hijack a cell's protein-building machinery in order to reproduce more viruses. They'll keep producing more viruses to infect more cells until the cell runs out of resources and dies. But cells aren't naive. Even when your body is exposed to a completely novel virus it has never seen before and for which you have not been vaccinated, you have what's known as an innate immune response. This has nothing to do with the acquired or adaptive immunity like vaccines or the immunity you get from previously being sick such as with chickenpox. In fact, that kind of acquired immunity, also known as specific immunity, is only a minute percentage of your total immune system. Acquired immunity is very slow because it takes time to learn about an infectious agent and tailor a response to destroy it. And it can only do so by getting sick first, unless there's a vaccine to speed up the process. A few days ago, the CEO of pharmaceutical giant Novartis was on CNBC saying that he doesn't think we'll have a coronavirus vaccine inside of a year. The reality is it will take over a year, in my expectation, to really find a new vaccine for this. So we need to really use epidemiological controls to, to really get this uh, situation in a better place. Meanwhile, your body is fighting off billions of viruses and bacteria on a regular basis without needing a vaccine and without having to get sick at all. That's because the innate immune system only needs to recognize non-self foreign particles known as antigens. It doesn't need to know anything specific about them except that they don't belong. And so the first response to a viral infection is an innate or non-specific immune response. And if that response is strong enough, you may eradicate the infection before ever feeling any symptoms of illness at all. And that's exactly what we're after. So the first innate immune response that occurs when a cell is invaded by a virus is the detection of antigenic material, which might be glycoproteins or genetic material such as RNA that the cell can recognize as non-self. When this happens, the cell starts producing proteins called cytokines, which can perform several functions. They can interfere with virus replication, these are called interferons. They can warn neighboring cells that a virus attack is underway and to likewise protect themselves. They can shut down the cell's protein building capacity to deny the virus the ability to reproduce. They can activate apoptosis, which is programmed cell death in which the cell produces protein-destroying enzymes. They can turn off the cell surface markers called histocompatibility complex, which are basically a friend beacon in the innate immune system's friend or foe identification system. This allows white blood cells to attack the infected cell as if it's a foreign invader itself. They can stimulate inflammation, which is the dilation of blood vessels and the filling of interstitial space with fluid in order to allow white blood cells to flow into the area. They can call out to white blood cells and track them to the area of infection. They can stimulate proliferation of more immune cells, and they can stimulate a change in the body's temperature set point, causing a fever. Not all cells release all of these different kinds of cytokines. Many of them are only released by white blood cells and other immune cells later in the infection response. But some of them are released by the cells that are under attack to help them stimulate an immediate immune response. Approximately 50 to 70 percent of all white blood cells are an innate immune system cell called a neutrophil. These are usually the first to arrive when a cell is under attack by a virus. Neutrophils, along with macrophages and dendritic cells, are phagocytes, which literally means eating cell. When they detect an antigen, they engulf it in a process called phagocytosis, thus encapsulating it within the neutrophil in a bubble called a phagosome. The neutrophil then merges the phagosome with another bubble called a lysosome, which contains enzymes and acids that the neutrophil has created. Once merged, these components generate something called a respiratory burst, 
which is a rapid release of reactive oxygen species including superoxide radical, hydrogen peroxide, peroxynitrite, hydroxyl radical, and hypochlorite, aka chlorine bleach. As you can imagine, this concoction absolutely obliterates whatever happens to be inside the phagosome. It sterilizes the environment better than an autoclave and then dumps the inactivated refuse back into the interstitial space and goes on eating more pathogens. But how does the neutrophil survive the respiratory burst itself? Primarily, it packs its cell membranes with fat-soluble antioxidants, vitamin E and vitamin A. These antioxidants are able to protect the phagosome membrane from becoming oxidized and breaking down. However, when one of these fat-soluble antioxidants absorbs a free radical, it becomes deactivated and can no longer protect the membrane. Eventually, the defenses would be gone and the neutrophil couldn't work anymore. And so neutrophils fill up their cytosol, or intracellular fluid, with the water-soluble antioxidants vitamin C and glutathione. Vitamin C is able to recharge the oxidized fat-soluble antioxidants, making them active again, and glutathione is able to recharge vitamin C. Thus, the neutrophils can keep eating pathogens as long as they have enough antioxidants. These antioxidants are also in the interstitial fluid to clean up the dumped phagosome contents so they don't damage the surrounding cells. Lack of sufficient antioxidants would result in tissue oxidation, necrosis, sepsis, vasculitis, and neutrophil autophagic cell death. Therefore, in order to survive a pandemic infection, you must have supplemental antioxidant vitamins. Recommended daily amounts are not enough. When you're not facing an infectious onslaught, RDAs are sufficient for everyday bodily functions. But when your innate immune system is activated, you must feed it significantly more antioxidants in order to produce additional phagocytotic cells and to keep them supplied as your frontline soldiers. Increasing vitamin C and vitamin E especially has been shown to stimulate immune function and result in an increased resistance to infection. So my first recommendation is to buy a bottle of sea salts for every member of your family. And when I say sea salts, I don't mean S-E-A salt, not sea salt. I mean the brand, the letter C dash S-A-L-T. Sea salts is a mineral buffered vitamin C powder that is easier on your stomach and more bioavailable than ascorbic acid. It also gives you a little bit of supplemental minerals as well. I will include a link in the video description to this product. You can add a teaspoon of sea salts to every glass of water that you drink. There's no upper limit to how much vitamin C you can consume. It's impossible to overdose. The worst thing that will happen if you take too much at once is you'll get loose stools, but not if you stagger your intake all day long, which is why I suggest adding a teaspoon to each glass of water that you drink. Taking high-dose vitamin C will ensure that your neutrophils keep working at peak performance. Studies have shown that up to 10,000 milligrams per day can be used during an aggressive infection. Whatever you do, don't drink orange juice in an attempt to get vitamin C. Fructose is toxic, and studies have shown that white blood cells will actually preferentially engulf fructose instead of pathogens to keep it out of your blood. In fact, avoid all forms of sugar, including fruits. You would never get enough vitamin C from whole foods anyway. Supplementation is really the only way to get an efficient megadose. My next recommendation is to supplement with Core Med Science's liposomal active B complex plus minerals. This multivitamin contains all the fat-soluble antioxidant vitamins in a highly bioavailable form. It also contains active, which means methylated or phosphorylated, B vitamins. This is super important because it supports mitochondrial ATP production that's essential for generating the respiratory burst. It also supports detoxification and elimination pathways to remove all the byproducts of destroyed pathogens and damaged cells. Moreover, it contains essential minerals zinc, selenium, and manganese. Zinc and manganese are needed for the enzyme superoxide dismutase, which is what helps break down reactive oxygen species into less reactive chemicals. Vitamin B6 is also vital for this. Selenium is required for the enzyme glutathione peroxidase, along with vitamin B2, which also helps to break down reactive oxygen species. And zinc helps to produce uric acid, which is an intercellular antioxidant that helps to scavenge free radicals that result from the respiratory burst. Moreover, NADP, which is the coenzyme responsible for the respiratory burst, needs vitamin B1. So this is really a one-stop shop for many of the vital elements that's needed to help carry out the innate immune process. I highly recommend taking at least the recommended daily amount, or more if you suspect that you're infected. My third recommendation is resveratrol. Studies have shown that resveratrol can increase the expression of superoxide dismutase, glutathione peroxidase, and NADPH oxidase by upwards of 1400%, thereby supporting neutrophil action and protecting tissues from oxidative stress. My fourth recommendation is a good vitamin D3 and K2 supplement. These two fat-soluble vitamins should always be taken together since their functions are complementary. During the winter especially, most people are deficient in vitamin D. 
but having enough vitamin D has been shown to increase glutathione levels by up to 42%. A 2011 article in the journal Clinical Virology noted multiple studies showing that vitamin D is especially antiviral against developed viruses like coronavirus. And a 2017 meta-analysis published in the British Medical Journal found that vitamin D supplementation protected against acute respiratory tract infections similar to coronavirus pneumonia by induction and support of innate immune functions. Vitamin D is also extremely important in the adaptive immune system for T-cell activation. So if you have an infection that progresses beyond the innate immune response, then vitamin D will help with the specific immune response as well, so you can still recover. And my fifth recommendation for preventing coronavirus morbidity is to ensure adequate probiotic intake, either through fermented foods such as sauerkraut, yogurt, and cheese, or through a probiotic supplement. As Hippocrates said, all disease begins in the gut. That's because 70% of your lymphocyte-producing immune cells are located in your gastrointestinal lining. A 2018 literature review published in the journal Current Pharmaceutical Design cited multiple studies showing that probiotic bacteria greatly improved innate immune response and reduced the onset and duration of respiratory infections by stimulating interferons, activating dendritic cells, and inducing the cytotoxic activity of natural killer cells. By activating or goosing the innate immune response, probiotics in your gut give your body advance notice of an infection before your cells even need to suffer an attack themselves. So there you have it, five actions you can take right now to supercharge your innate immune system in order to smack down any infectious exposure you might encounter, even before it's able to make you sick, whether it's coronavirus or seasonal flu or anything else. But I kind of fibbed a little bit because while these five things are all super important, I didn't actually tell you about the number one surefire secret weapon that has been proven by dozens of scientific studies to crush viral infections, including coronavirus. But that really deserves a video of its own. And so stay tuned to my channel and I'll reveal how this almost miraculous all natural product that you can grow in your own backyard is able to lay waste to pathogens from multiple angles. If you haven't already, subscribe to my channel and hit the bell icon to receive update notifications for when I post new content. And if you found this advice to be valuable, please do share it and spread this important information so we can help everyone become immune to this pandemic. Thanks and see you next time.